Hey guys, today I don't have a guitar amplifier, even though that's usually what I uh, tend to do. I absolutely love um, loud music. I'm a real audiophile, but I'm not one of those guys that buys the $500 cables. Um, but I do uh, understand the beauty and the glory of a really good, uh, clean signal path. And um, I don't know if you guys know the Blue Glow Electronics uh, webpage. It's on YouTube and it's absolutely fantastic. And the guy that runs it is named Mark. And uh, probably a few years ago, well, probably just over a year ago, he started doing this uh, KT88 tube single-ended amplifier build. And uh, at the time, I was watching him do the 807 um, amplifier build, build. And I decided um, before I had the money for the 807, he started doing the KT88. And since the KT88 was a lot simpler, I decided to do that. And uh, I was kind of halfway thinking about doing a video on it, and then I decided um, about two weeks ago when this uh, beautiful thing decided to crap out on me, that what I would do is a video um, that had two purposes. One, show you what happened, what went wrong with this amplifier, and how I'm going to fix it. And then secondly, what I would do differently were I uh, building this again, which I do actually plan on doing, because sooner or later my son or my son-in-law will see this and decide they just need to have one. So um, that's the purpose of this video. Let me kind of real quickly go through this thing. Um, pretty much uh, these huge transformers, two output transformers rated at 25 watts, a power transformer and a choke, two KT88 output tubes, uh, both single-ended, uh, five AR4 rectifier, which is what the schematic calls for. Mine's using a 5Y3 right now. And then an ECC85 driver tube. And then, uh, you know, you take the, you basically order a chassis, you get out a drill and some hole punches, and uh, you um, hack away at the uh, metal chassis, and then you um, spend a few hours building it and testing it and tweaking it, and it's just a load of fun. Um, and it's also an amazing circuit. I mean, this thing is dead quiet, gets super loud with good efficient speakers, and um, I just wanna encourage you, if you're out there and you're kind of in the do-it-yourself thing, or if you're watching some of my videos and other people's videos where they modify amplifiers or work on them a little bit, you should definitely um, try something like this out. Like I said, uh, Blue Glow Electronics is the name of the channel. It's like a 14 part series where he uh, goes through in detail. Trust me, I would not have been able to do this without his input. In fact, if you look at his final uh, build and then you look at mine, you're not gonna see much difference because I basically ripped him off. So um, let me go ahead and describe in a little bit of detail what went wrong. So a few weeks ago, I was listening to this thing. Um, I'd never listened to it for more than about an hour or two at a time. Um, at about hour five of a long listening session, um, it cut out. And at first I thought it was the Chromecast that died on me because it works off of a, ba a battery because I don't want to run a plug. Uh, but that wasn't it. It was uh, still running and the preamp was still running. It was the power amplifier that had gone. So I shut everything down, uh, not that it was making any noise at the time anyway, and I heard a hissing noise. And it was obviously coming from under here and there was a little bit of smoke coming out. So um, I got a little bit concerned, waited for it to cool down, unplugged it, checked it out, and one of the, um, one of the ca capacitors coming off the B plus rail, there's really no other way to describe it right now without looking at the schematic, one of these uh, capacitors was woefully underrated for what it was supposed to be. I think it was a 450 volt cap and I was running about 460 volts through it. And, um, you know, kudos to the cap. It made it um, probably a total of about 18 hours in one hour and maybe two hour increments before it finally blew. But when it had to deal with that kind of voltage for five hours in a row, it uh, gave up the ghost. So um, what I'm going to do is I've ordered some uh, replacement capacitors and uh, put those in. And then we can, um, I'll go ahead and show you guys uh, what it looks like now, and then when I'm done uh, repairing it, we'll uh, test it, and I'll talk about any other changes that I'd like to make. 
All right, so here it is. And if you spend any time watching Mark's videos, you'll understand that there's not much I did differently than he did. And the area in question are these two caps here. So that brings me to my first uh, thing that I would do differently, and that is order the right parts and make sure you have them. And if somebody's out of stock on something, don't just say, oh, I'll get those later and then forget to do it. Because basically when we came down to finishing, I shouldn't say we, when I came down to finishing everything, I realized that um, I had still not gotten these 33 microfarad at 400 volt capacitors. Well, one thing you're instantly noticing is that 400 volts, when that observed voltage there is 442, is obviously wrong. You need at least, well, 500 volts. Um, I can't remember what my observed voltage on here was, but it wasn't far off of that 442 that Mark um, encountered. And so what I did end up buying were these... Um, I went to either Amazon or eBay, I can't honestly remember, and I bought a, what is the home, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I bought 10 of these 450 volt, 33 microfarad capacitors, um, you know, generic, no name, what do they say on them, Changjin, Changjin, um, anyway. Honestly, I can't say that it's the, the capacitor's fault because um, if I'm running a 450 volt capacitor with 442 or 445 volts on it, uh, that's sort of my fault. So, what I've done since then is gone to Mauser and gotten some Nichicon 500 volt 33 microfarad capacitors. I'll be replacing both of these capacitors. That one um, hasn't exhibited any signs of failure that, yet. This is the one that failed, as you can see. Actually, you can't see. I'll probably get in there a little bit closer. But the top, there was a little, little dro droplets of electrolyte um, that were here that have since dried up. And the vent cap has pretty much um, opened up. And the, um, the paint, uh, not the paint, but rather the uh, plastic sheeting um, it's almost like a shrink wrap material that has gone on here has split from it probably expanding so so the plan is replace these capacitors check all of the resistor values all the component values going all the way through the circuit both before and after that and then um, and then go ahead and fire it up as normal um, if nothing else looks like it caused any problems so that's the fix. It seems like it's going to be pretty simple. I do have a feeling that the problem there was that I was using 450 volt capacitors, even though it's far more, um, or far better practice to use at least a 500 volt there. So anyway, I would pretty much uh, put that all down to me inexperienced, uh, being inexperienced and being in a hurry. So first mistake was not ordering the capacitors when they were out of stock. Um, not going somewhere else and ordering them. And then secondly, um, when I realized that I was kind of desperate and so I um, went the cheap route. Not that it was really a problem of, of expense, it was more of a problem of uh, they were available and I went ahead and just clicked buy and I should have been a little bit more patient and a lot more smarter. So as promised, there's a close-up of those bad boys. See how it's sort of split and um, come apart. And the other one is probably um, ready to do that at any moment. So gonna have to go through there and um, look at those a lot more carefully. As long as I'm in here, um, I will go ahead and check all the other voltages too and see how my bias is working and you know, all those things that I made sure I did all that before I started listening to it, but everything settled in a little bit more. So um, it'll definitely be interesting to get that information. Okay, our story so far. Uh, there's the replacement capacitors. I was a little nervous about one of those, um, one of those resistors. It just didn't look great. But anyway, it measures fine. Both of them measure fine. I even took them out of circuit just in case. 
Uh, right now we're monitoring the B plus going through after it goes through this uh, 4.7 K resistor. Um, obviously there are two of these. You see uh, B plus coming off as 460. Mine actually measures about 472. And then it goes through that 4.7 K resistor and it's supposed to be, well, Mark, Mark noticed 442. Mine's 441. It's pretty damn close, which is weird because he said 460 and 442. I measure 471, but 442. So, I don't know, that's a little bit bizarre. Um, but anyway, I will think, I think I'll go ahead and measure all these other ones since I used to have a schematic with all the stuff written down. I don't know what I did with it. It's probably around somewhere. But anyway, um, the point of all this is that, as I said, I replaced those uh, Nichicon, or I replaced the cheap no name ones with the Nichicon 500 volts. We're at 440, so we should be fine on that. So um, I'll go ahead and monitor it a little bit more. I brought it up on a Variac nice and slowly. And um, everything seems to be fine. I do have it on some dummy load resistors right now, which I haven't even checked to see if those are getting warm yet. No, there's no signal applied right now. So, um, But I might as well check the bias and everything else while I'm in here. And then we'll talk about the actual build. Okay, I've buttoned it all up. And after I wrote down all my um, observed voltages, as well as the voltage drop, so I can figure out my <clears throat> uh, figure out my bias. So now it's time to uh, flip it over, take it back upstairs. But everything's tested and it works just fine. Uh, say as long as I've got it upside down here, I'm going to talk about some of the things I did that I would do differently. One. I really didn't feel like cutting uh, the IEC connector and wiring it all up, so I just threw in a three-prong cord and um, tied it off with some strain relief. Eh, if I had it to do over again, I'd take the time to do the IEC connector. It's, it's come in, it's come in. It would have come in handy a few times. Um, let's see. I'm glad that I bought the really high-end componentry where it was an option especially the high-end capacitors, especially um, the really nice uh, music caps, uh, audiophile ones. Um, you can see back here the uh, switch for the ultra-linear versus triad mode. Um, listen to it in triad mode and just never did like it. So if I had my druthers, I would just not even use that switch. I would just, you know, decrease the signal path I would not even bother with it. Another thing I would change probably uh, over there somewhere in that big pile of stuff, actually, you can almost see it around the corner there, is a preamp that I'm uh, currently restoring. And toward that end, I would probably not even do a volume pot. I would just use the uh, preamp to control the volume keep the signal trace or the signal lines even shorter and cleaner um, and I think as far as as far as actually wiring out and layout that's one thing that I those are the only things I would change um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see these power tube sockets but I turned them instead of going um, even or perpendicular I kind of turned them and I did that so you could see the logo on the tubes because I really kind of like the gold lion logos that say KT88 up front in fact I'm going to put a little name plaque here um, so I turned those the only problem is is because those mount those terminal strips are mounted off of those uh, mounting holes it ended up not being as beautiful of a layout as Mark's. Plus, I'm not nearly as good as Mark, but um, that's something that instead of uh, thinking it looks cool that nobody would appreciate, I probably would have done differently. So, let's get upstairs, flip it over, and I'll talk about a few last things. Okay, so um, before I buttoned everything up and came back upstairs, I um, adjusted the bias, and honestly, I was very surprised and a little bit dismayed 
when I noticed how high all my voltages were. I could not get the power supply voltage under control. It was um, 30 to 40 volts higher than it was when I first uh, built this thing. So rather than put in some dropping resistors in the uh, power supply, what I decided to do was just change out to a 5Y3 rectifier. That lowers all my voltages because it's not quite as uh, efficient, I guess you could call it. And um, I probably will um, address that later. Um, one thing that I also did was I changed my bias resistors. Uh, one thing that I would recommend if you do build this is pay special attention to the build, uh, to the list of uh, materials because you probably will want to up those, uh, res those capacitors. Um, coming off the B plus rail and going into the uh, plate of the preamp tube, you will probably want to change those to at least 500 volt. And um, what I also did was change the uh, bias resistor, resistors in the power tubes to 750 ohms to cool down my um, to cool down my uh, bias, which was at about 91 milliamps. And I've since read though that uh, those KT88s work great at about 100% plate dissipation, which is uh, just something I'm not used to thinking about. So I probably will heat them back up a little bit because uh, now that I've got them running quite a bit cooler, in fact, they're running well under 70% right now, um, I don't like the way it sounds anymore. So I'm going to boost that up, but probably not up to where it was. And I have 25 watt uh, 750 ohm resistors in here. I'll probably go back to 500. Uh, that combined with the lower plate voltage should give me um, more like 80 to 90 percent, I'm hoping. Um, but I am going to go with the 25 watt resistors because the 10 watt resistors that are called for in the schematic um, and the bill of materials are just a little bit light, I think, for the kind of uh, current you're running. Um, I think that's about it. I just want to encourage everybody out there, go on audiokarma.org and search for Blue Glow, and you will find a 29 page, as, as of right now, uh, thread on building this amplifier. You do not need tons of skill to build this amplifier. You need to have a basic understanding of electronics. Um, you need to have a little bit of uh, skill as far as metalworking, um, soldering skills, which if you don't have them, you'll have them by the end of this, um, you know, this project. And, um, I think that's about it. I mean, I really want to encourage everybody who's even a little bit interested. Things, something like this would cost you multiple thousands of dollars from an audiophile website. Um, and you can basically get a proven design. I think all in I was about $780 for this. And that includes buying some parts that I'll be able to use forever. Like um, the hole punches for making these uh, holes for the uh, tube sockets. Um, a couple of uh, deburring tools and things like that, which add up, but you know, um, I'll have them for the next time too. So, a uh, big thank you to Mark at Blue Glow for taking all the time to put forth um, the effort for these videos. And a uh, big shout out to the guys on Audio Karma um, that are sharing all their knowledge with you. So, thanks a lot. We'll be back to guitar amplifiers in a couple of days. Thanks.